Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast with Dr. Brett Schur. Today I'm joined by Dr. Jake Kushner. Now, Dr. Kushner is an MD and endocrinologist, and he was the, the head of the pediatric diabetes and endocrinology section at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. And he, he has extensive experience helping patients with type 1 diabetes. Now, a little definition. I mean, we go into some of this uh, in the talk, but type 1 diabetes, basically known as juvenile diabetes, although it's not always in kids, but it's more of the autoimmune condition when your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin. And these patients are absolutely dependent on having insulin shots and insulin infusions, very different from type 2 diabetes, which is what we're usually talking about. Now, Dr. Kushner, in dealing with kids and adolescents and teenagers and families has learned not only the importance of treating people physically, but the emotional side of treating diabetes that comes with this. And he's learned along with people like Dr. Bernstein and groups like the type one grit that we talk about, how to use low carb lifestyles and low carb nutrition to help people not only physically, but emotionally with the challenges of type one diabetes. And it's it's really eye-opening and, and almost earth-shattering because people would think that you need your carbohydrates when you have diabetes and you simply cover it with insulin. And that's been the paradigm for years. But this new way of seeing things is really paving the way for hopefully better health care and better experiences for people with diabetes. So he's made a transition now where he's working for McNair Interests, which is a private equity group specifically looking for companies uh, that they can help invest in to help further the impact that they can have on type 1 diabetes. Uh, now, he's still trying to keep his foot in clinical practice as well, and I'm glad for that because clearly when you hear him, you can see how good he is at dealing with people and helping people, but yet at the same time, he's trying to help find the next big thing to help patients with type 1 diabetes. So I hope you enjoy his perspective, um, and a lot of the lessons here do you help someone that you may know with type 1 diabetes. As always, we don't give medical advice. This is meant for general knowledge and hopefully knowledge that you can then take to your physician or help someone um, find a physician who's more knowledgeable in these fields to see if it's something that they can use to help them. So with that disclaimer, enjoy this interview with Dr. Jake Kushner. Dr. Jake Kushner, welcome to the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks so much. Yeah, Happy to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Now, I, you know, I've heard you speak so much about about type one diabetes and specifically a low carbohydrate approach to it. And I have to be honest, when I was first approached a couple of years ago about who I would not put on a low carb diet, type one people with type <laughs> one diabetes were the first people to pop into my mind, just because they were in my mind at the time. They were sort of like this dangerous black box that we don't want to touch. And then I learned more about Dr. Bernstein and I heard your talks and all of a sudden I had a complete 180 and it almost seemed like they were, they then became almost the perfect person to, to try on a, on a low carb diet. So you were very influential in helping me formulate my opinion on that. So first I want to say thank you with that. Um, but before we get more into that, I want to learn more about you. So what initially motivated you to get into endocrinology and specifically diabetes? Because I have to be honest, I remember my pediatric diabetes rotation, mm -hmm. and it my memory is was it was a lot of cranky and moody teenagers that you had to sort of fight and argue with, and it didn't seem like a lot of fun, but that was one perspective from many, many years ago. So give me your perspective and what sort of got you into this field. Okay, so uh, I was one of these people trying to decide in between uh, a career in medicine or a career in science. I decided bec to become a physician scientist. Oddly, my vision of being a physician scientist was always to be a pediatric physician scientist. And I thought, you know, I, I love being around children. I love supporting them. And and maybe I could combine these two interests. So and that was going on from when I was maybe 13 or 14 years old. I was, I was considering becoming wow. a pediatrician. And my parents are scientists. And there were physicians also in my family, including my uh, great-grandfather. And so I, I thought that it would be a very nice mix. And so I didn't really understand uh, endocrinology, what it was or what its potential was. But there was this rich tradition of studying endocrinology uh, amongst scientists uh, in the 70s and 80s. And it, my, my parents were both postdoctoral research fellows at UCSF. And so there were many great physician scientists there, including 
one of my dad's mentors, uh, the late Dr. John Baxter. And so he was a pioneer in applying science to endocrinology. And there were many other physician scientists who went into endocrinology as a result of it. The thought was, you know, there are hormones, you could clone them, you could understand them, you could understand their regulation, and you might be able to ultimately figure out ways to help people through, through molecular biology. And so I, I was interested in these ideas, and then the developmental biology revolution came along. And so I, I thought uh, I wanted to learn developmental biology and apply it to endocrinology. And so I went to Boston Children's with this idea, not really understanding that I would get involved um, uh, in diabetes. So I was a fellow in pediatric endocrinology there, and I was caring for uh, a variety of patients. Half of what we do in endocrinology is what I call it esoterica endocrinologica. It's the rare, unusual, complicated uh, disorder where someone's missing a particular hormone. But um, the other half of what we do is caring for kids with diabetes. And I just saw those kids and those parents, and I imagined myself in that situation, and I thought that there was just tremendous unmet need. And so it was clearly, it, it was a calling for me in that there, were, there was a demand for something new and something novel. Uh, and so I, I began to follow the patients as a, as a fellow in endocrinology. I became the, the primary endocrinologist. I was also almost like the diabetes nurse educator. I was the person who they called for school letters and prescriptions. And, yeah. um, and I just got to know these families. And from that, I just fell you know, hopelessly uh, into the world of, of diabetes. And that, so that, that's really remained my professional identity ever since, it's, since 1997. Wow, that's fantastic. All right. So you've been doing research and caring for patients ever since 1997. That's right. Oh, all and, right. And uh, well, what happened was as fellows in endocrinology, we had a two-year block of research. And so mm -hmm. I went to work at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, um, which is a famous place. And I worked yeah. in a beta cell biology lab and, um, and then ultimately switched to an insulin signaling lab and stayed there as a postdoc for almost five and a half years. Uh, so I established my research career and began to apply for grants and then ultimately took a faculty position uh, at UPenn in, in Philadelphia. And I uh, began a, a career as a beta cell biologist, uh, essentially trying to study the cells within the pancreas, within the islets of Langerhans that make insulin. Yeah, so let, let's rewind for a second and mm -hmm. talk about type 1 diabetes because we hear so much about type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So type 1 diabetes being, what, maybe like 5% of the population with diabetes? That's right. Is that right. pretty accurate? Yeah, and with a very different pathophysiology. So um, tell us a little bit about what separates type 1 from type 2. Okay, so type 2 diabetes is what we think of generically as diabetes or what a lot of people think of as diabetes, and it's associated with being overweight and and this, this metabolic insulin resistance. Um, and it is uh, incredibly common uh, throughout the world. Type 1 diabetes is, the, in some ways, the more primordial form of diabetes in that uh, back, uh, before we were overweight or insulin resistant, uh, many people, all, in some populations, most people who got diabetes actually had type 1. So... In, in traditionally skinny populations, these people would be healthy and cruising around living their lives, and all of a sudden they would begin to get symptoms of uh, uncontrolled diabetes, such as thirst and frequent urination. And um, if you were to check their blood glucose, you'd discover that it's high. And they have, uh, in some cases, ketones in the urine. And what's happening is it's an autoimmune condition. So uh, the 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 B cells and the T cells uh, attack the pancreas and ultimately generate um, an autoimmune response and remove the, the ability to make insulin. So these beta cells uh, within the pancreas of the islets of Langerhans, those beta cells are, are preferentially lost in type 1 diabetes. It's largely a T cell disease, though the B, though the B cells, which make antibodies, also contribute. Mm -hmm. And over time, people just completely lose the ability to make insulin. So insulin is life-sustaining for them. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. It, even though it's diabetes, type 1 and type 2, it's almost like they're opposite diseases. With type 2, 
usually having involved involving too much insulin, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance and type one right. and absence of insulin. So without insulin, it's life threatening. So how are these patients treated before we had in, insulin as a medication? So there was something called the, uh, there was a, a restrictive diet uh, that was pioneered by Dr. Allen. And essentially what they did was it was a, a small amount of calories and it was, uh, and there was almost no carbohydrates. It was largely fat and protein. And so the idea was minimal uh, substrate and almost nothing that required insulin. Mm -hmm. And some people have called it a starvation diet. That's not really true. It, they were essentially in nutritional ketosis. And they, if you found someone who was newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, say a teenager, and you place them on this Allen diet, they might be able to live for several years. But they were very, very thin. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, without that, they would waste away and die within months. So without insulin as a medication, it was a temporizing measure, but That's certainly right. better than the usual high-carbohydrate diet. Then it was a, a clear, quick death sentence. But then insulin is discovered, insulin right. as a medication, which you know revolutionizes the treatment for type 1 diabetes. We talk about insulin in such a negative way, but really, I mean, it has been life-saving. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. But then what happened to the dietary treatment of diabetes? How did right, that so, change? Yeah, what? so this is complicated. Um, some of the best stuff you can read about this comes from Dr. Elliot Joslin in Boston, and he pioneered the use of insulin in people with type 1 diabetes in the United States. He had a type 1 diabetes-specific clinic, and he developed protocols to use this, this new reagent, insulin, in people with type 1. And what he discovered was it was very difficult to get blood sugars in the normal range. At the time, they couldn't actually test blood sugars. They really just tested sugar in the urine. But his goal was to try to figure out a way to, uh, to get people under control. And he, um, he studied people with type 1 diabetes for, for the first few decades following the discovery of insulin. And unfortunately, during that time, what we now know of as diabetes complications began to arise. Mm. So there's an amazing paper that describes retinitis, the diabetic retinopathy and diabetic nephropathy and so complications to the yeah, eyes and the kidneys, kidneys from diabetes as well as heart disease mm. and, and vascular disease and stroke yeah. and so there was this realization that uh, if you replace the insulin people were going to end up suffering these terrible complications and then a big question arose as to how to minimize those complications Joslin was a proponent of this idea of trying to get the blood sugars as close to normal as possible and he came about that perspective gradually following patients and thinking really deeply about diabetes. There were other people who believed that diabetes complications were simply controlled by genetics and that they were random or stochastic. So there was an intense debate in the, in the field about how to minimize complications. And, uh, and, and, and the field you know, was, was really uh, divided into these two extreme camps. Yeah, it's interesting because now it just makes sense. Of course you have to get the blood sugar down. So it's fascinating to know it wasn't mm -hmm. always agreed upon. Right. And then, then the trial started happening. Then we started to get data to, to show that lower levels of blood glucose with hemoglobin A1C being a very, very common measure of sort of the three-month average of glucose that the lower that was, the lower the risk of complications. But tell us a little bit about the difference between microvascular and macrovascular complications. Okay, so microvascular complications we think of as um, the, the things that happen around the eye and the kidney and, and uh, also in the skin and the nervous system. There's something called uh, diabetic uh, gastroparesis. Mm -hmm. Where so the stomach doesn't the empty sto well. Yeah, where the nerves in the stomach are, are altered and the stomach loses its ability to to empty well. People can also get numbness and diabetic neuropathy mm -hmm. and, and uh, very painful pins and needles-like sensations. Yeah. So those are all the microvascular. microvascular. Yeah. And then macrovascular we, is, is the big vessel disease. So macro, large, vascular, vessel, heart attack, stroke. And ultimately, uh, uh, cardiovascular death is the most common uh, endpoint for people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Yeah. It's, it's really the, the, the major scary thing that happens. 
Now, is there a difference, though, in being able to affect those outcomes with treating blood glucose to a certain level? Okay, so this, is the, uh, this question um, was really the focus of a lot of diabetes doctors over the 60s and 70s and 80s, and they lobbied for a clinical trial to try to figure this out, and that ultimately became something called the DCCT, the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial. And it's a pretty amazing study what they did was they took people with type 1 diabetes who were fairly newly diagnosed. So they take 1,400 patients, mostly uh, adolescents and young adults, and they randomized them either to the standard care of the day, which was typically one or in some cases two shots a day, and just focus on support, comfort care, supporting mm -hmm. people and helping them to feel good and advising them to regulate their their meals so they didn't eat too much of any particular carbohydrate in any one meal. And then the other alternative was this very uh, aggressive control of glucose. And at the time, there was really no standard therapy to treat type 1 diabetes and get blood sugars down to near normal levels. But what they, what the, what they did was they leveraged each of these centers and they had them contribute their ideas in weekly phone calls, and they developed best practices. So each center tried things a little bit differently. Some had people visit very often. Some people used phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially what they did was they tried to help people think about using more insulin and, uh, and, and getting their blood sugars down to near normal levels. They had imagined that they would get the glycated hemoglobin, which is the precursor to hemoglobin A1c, down in the normal range. They were unable to do that. What they did was in the control group, it was around 9%, and in the intervention group, they got it down to 7%. They planned to do this study for a decade, but they had to stop early. So they only did the study for seven and a half years. And the reason was there was a safety and monitoring board that's looking at the two groups silently in the background, and they saw a vast difference in between the rates of diabetic nephropathy and the diabetic retinopathy, mm -hmm. that is the kidney and eye disease. And they felt that it was uh, immoral to keep this knowledge from the general public. So they had to stop the study. They um, ultimately presented the data at the American Diabetes Association, and they published it in the New England Journal. So that study changed our field forever. It was a very expensive study to do. They used an immense amount of resources. Uh, but what it showed is that very tight control and blood sugars that were near normal could reduce the rate of diabetes complications and type 1 diabetes. And that's really exciting. So for people who live with type 1 diabetes, it means that these terrible, terrible complications like blindness and kidney failure, that, that those things are, are, are not absolutely given and that there is a possibility that people could begin to to prevent those. Yeah. And it's sort of revolutionary because if you were born with type 1 diabetes, there was almost no chance you were going to live sort of a quote unquote normal life or a healthy lifespan until we learned that more intensive treatment improved those outcomes. So it was pretty revolutionary for the treatment of diabetes, but it came at a cost, right? Because right. this isn't something you can just dial in and be accurate with 100% of the time. And the risk was you would lower blood sugar too much and people would become hypoglycemic and symptomatic and possibly life-threatening. So there needs to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I want to talk about how it's sort of traditionally done now in the sense that people are told to eat a certain amount of carbohydrates and cover it with the right amount of insulin. So people with type 1 diabetes are supposed to know how to calculate exactly how much insulin for right. exactly how much carbohydrate. And if you do too much, you get hypoglycemic. If you don't do enough, your blood sugar goes too high. So tell us about the, the sort of the intricacies of this calculation because it sounds simple. You calculate your carbohydrates, you cal calculate your insulin, but in practical purposes, it's not so easy, is it? Yeah, so there's all these different variables that actually affect it. You're supposed to carry out this algebraic equation. And so you're supposed to know your insulin to carbohydrate ratio and also your insulin correction factor. That is the amount of insulin that's required to reduce your blood glucose. And so imagine if your blood sugar is slightly above normal and you need to re reduce it to the normal level, and then you also want to consume some carbohydrate, then you would carry out this calculation or use some app on your phone, and then you would administer the insulin, and then you're uh, supposed to administer the insulin a precise amount of time before the meal starts. So imagine, uh, okay, I'm going to eat in 25 minutes, 
And I believe that this meal contains exactly 75 grams of carbohydrates. Okay, so that's a guess, but then how do you really know how many grams of carbohydrates you're consuming? And a whole other question goes, are there other elements in the food that could um, modify the kinetics of the glucose absorption? And so in some cases, people consume quite a bit of fat, and those carbs are very slowly absorbed. In other cases, people will have um, abnormalities in their GI tract. So type 1 diabetes is associated with loss of insulin, but it's also associated with loss of another hormone called amylin. And so amylin is uh, actually a very potent regulator of gastric emptying. Mm -hmm. And so people with type 1 diabetes will empty their stomach quite rapidly. And so you could have some instances where even though you give the right amount of insulin, it doesn't act fast enough. And uh, you're also trying to match the kinetic curve of the insulin that you administer to the glucose rise. And that's hopelessly difficult to do. And then you're also trying to think about your insulin sensitivity as a static factor, but it changes in different people. And it can change in women based on, on, this, on, on the stage of the menstrual health. Mm -hmm. you know, and what about just status? how well you've slept and your stress level and all if you've that. exercised, all right. of that plays into it. So right. how does this play on the emotions of most people who are teenagers when they're trying to deal with this and calculate all this? I'd, I'd imagine it would just be very difficult for a lot of them to, to handle. Well, it, it depends upon your level of scrutiny. So if you're at most kids with type, most kids with type 1 diabetes are diagnosed when they're around 8 or 10 and their parents are there helping them. And if your parents are are taking care of it and they're helping you and you don't have to think about it, then things are okay. You know, they tell you what to eat. You, you take the insulin at the appropriate time. You check your blood sugar three or four hours later. It's, um, there will be some disasters where they'll take too much insulin or too little, but from hour to hour, day to day, the burden isn't all that great. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a challenge to do all this stuff and it's very scary for families and there are dangers, but they don't, as, you, as kids get older, as they become teenagers and beyond, they start to think really hard about these challenges and they become frustrated because they'd like to go out with their friends, they'd like to have some spontaneity in their life, they don't have an adult watching over them, making suggestions about what they will eat and when and how, yeah. they're trying to build their independence and then they begin to uh, experience what I would call these glycemic disasters where they take too much or too little, their blood sugars can be really high. In some cases, they just forget to take insulin. Teenagers have a bunch of things on their minds, right? right? And, and uh, living with a chronic illness may be further down on the list compared to wh where their parents or their, or their healthcare team might want it. Yeah, and I think really all you need is one bad episode of hypoglycemia to feel how awful that is. And if it's in public with your friends, it can be embarrassing right. that you never want that to happen again. So I could see people purposely underdosing their insulin to make sure that doesn't happen, thus the cost being running higher blood sugars than they would otherwise like to simply to try and avoid that. We see this throughout the healthcare system. Uh, there are many nurses who, quote, like to run their patients sweet. <laughs> um, if you've worked in an, in an academic medical center or a community hospital, you, we've all seen this where the healthcare team feels more comfortable seeing blood sugars go high, and it's because of a fear of hypoglycemia. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately for the people who live with type 1 diabetes, or for that matter type 2, being high over a long time makes them feel awful, not just placing them at risk for complications. But it's hard for you to feel normal when your blood sugar's high. And uh, I have a friend who has type 1 diabetes, and uh, he went on, um, on a very tight regimen and was able to get his blood sugars down to near normal. And he said to me, you know, Jake, you, when you have type 1 diabetes, you forget what it's like to feel normal. Mm. If your blood sugar is high all the time, you just think that this is the way your brain is going to work. And there are people who sort of lose sight of, of, the, uh, of normal healthy life because their glucoses are always high and they just feel awful. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really sort of depressing to hear, but it, now it looks like there is another way to do it. So when we talk about treatment goals, the, the traditional treatment goal is a hemoglobin A1C of seven, right? And by a lot of the guidelines yeah. to try and balance the benefit without putting people at higher risk, but we know the risk starts well below seven. I mean, the risk yes. starts in the high fives and certainly in the mid sixes. 
So why wouldn't you want to treat to that level? Well, it's because we don't want to put people at risk for hypoglycemic episodes um, because of that swing, that variation. But is there a better way well, to treat the lower levels without having them have those swings? Many healthcare providers have given up on being able to get their uh, uh, the patients who they support to get their blood sugars down in the normal range. That is to say, with a hemoglobin A1C under 6%. And, and part of it is that they don't want to impose that burden, and they be, have begun to realize that it's unrealistic. Mm. So a lot of healthcare providers say, look, that's pretty good, you're fine. Actually, many adults with type 1 diabetes will go to a primary care, uh, a primary endocrinologist, and they'll say, oh, you're doing pretty good, your hemoglobin A1C is 7.5, that's fine. So, the, so these healthcare providers are trying to balance the challenges and the trade-offs, which include hypoglycemia and weight gain yeah. with too much insulin, good as point. well as the burden and the intensity of the therapy. Uh, and uh, in comparison, they, they sort of feel like, well, you know, if you, didn't, if you did it any less, it would be very challenging. So I'm just going to try to walk a fine line in the middle. And they don't see that many people who have blood sugars that are near normal. Mm -hmm. So they're not even aware that there are new therapies. Um, it's a little complicated with type 1 diabetes. I, I just want to briefly mention the, the issue around uh, novel therapies or the cure. Um, there has been a lot of hope that there would be transformative therapies for people with type 1 diabetes. And if you ask any parent of a child or any adult with type 1 diabetes about this issue, they will tell you that they've been uh, given narratives around when the cure might happen for type 1 diabetes. And there's a, a really a lot of hope that there would be some new novel transformative therapy that would help people with type 1. And that could uh, obviously take place in the form of some sort of biological cure or some sort of technological advancement. The problem with talking about the cure is it's a long and winding road to advance science. And so in my world, I, I, in my world as a basic scientist, what I've seen is it, it, it seems like we're constantly moving the goal line further and further away. And the reality is uh, the science of type 1 diabetes, how it happens, how the immune system decides to attack the pancreas, how the beta cells respond, why they decide to not make more beta cells, or how you would make beta cells in the first place to potentially replace them. All of those questions remain quite unsettled. And so, at least from a parent's perspective, there's still there has been this thought that, well, you know, it's coming around the corner. And so families are often said, told, hey, well, you know, is it gonna be when when is it coming? Yeah. It. When is it coming? Just hang in there until it, it gets here. It gets here. And so I've heard it be uh, a biological uh, therapy. I've also heard it as a technological therapy. Oh, we're going to infuse insulin or some other hormone. And by doing this and, and, and running it through some app, blood sugars will be near normal. Yeah. Um, but uh, those clinical trials have also uh, progressed. And, and I think it may be very, very difficult uh, to completely reverse type 1 diabetes or technology. Right. So we need better ways to control it and improve it until right. that time comes. And the role of diet is something that really, I don't think has been talked about much no, until the past year or two, really. It right. started to become much more popular because we've been so comfortable with this concept of count your carbohydrates, cover it with insulin. Right. So Do your best. Hang yeah, in there. Hang in there, right. Exactly. So what about just dramatically reducing carbohydrates to, a ke to ketogenic levels or very low carbohydrate levels, what impact can that have on patients with their need for insulins, their variation in their blood sugar, their A1Cs, their psychology? Right. Tell me about that. Well, I want to differentiate. Uh, there's two major low-carb approaches in type 1 diabetes. One is the approach that was pioneered by Dr. Richard Bernstein, which is really low-carb, high-protein. And he has emphasized protein in large amounts. And, and, a, and he tries to minimize uh, ketosis. Mm -hmm. And so his goal is to get people to consume lots of protein and to cover the protein with insulin. And he's uh, advocated using very judicious amounts of, of insulin. They typically use an intermediate form of insulin, something called human regular, which isn't used all that often anymore. 
because protein's a little bit slower to absorb and the blood sugar rise is slower and has a longer tail with protein compared to carbohydrates. Right. So you need a, a sort of a, a bit of a longer action on your insulin. And so uh, Dr. Bernstein has written this uh, amazing book, which is The Diabetes Solution. And um, it's now in its 12th edition. Wow. And he was diagnosed many, many years ago. He's now 85. He doesn't have any major diabetes complications. So he's the living testimony to this approach. It's right. really remarkable. And he has thousands and thousands of followers. There's a Facebook group that's devoted, it's called Type 1 Grit, that's devoted to this approach. And that's been very, very successful. Um, uh, another approach is to go uh, all the way into nutritional ketosis. And to get uh, into ketosis, you have to consume quite a bit of fat. Uh, so. You know, if you're low carb, high protein, that's 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 eating meat or steak or things like this. Uh, low carb, high fat, you have to aggressively think about ways to get more fat into your diet. Um, one advantage of of nutritional ketosis in type one diabetes is you're not consuming that much protein, and therefore there's less requirement for all that insulin to cover the protein. Uh, but one potential downside is the the ketones begin to rise. Yeah. And so you can have people with type 1 diabetes who are in nutritional ketosis who have beta hydroxybutyrates of around one millimolar. And that scares some people. Uh, I, we haven't had a lot of really good studies about people in nutritional ketosis and type 1 diabetes. But from my anecdotal experience of speaking to people, what I find is that it's actually a relatively safe condition. So people are able to do that. And essentially what they're doing is they're restricting Carbohydrates, they're taking not that much uh, carbs, very few refined carbs over the course of the day. They're consuming protein, and they go out of their way to find fat in their diet. And if you look at the macronutrient distribution, it's around 70% fat. Mm -hmm. So those folks will have, uh, eventually what they do well, over the course of a few weeks is switching to this approach, they become fat burning because fat is the only macronutrient that's consistently available in their blood and their body adapts to burning fat. And so um, they start to essentially consistently burn this macronutrient that's always available, and they lose all the variation in blood glucose. And so, so they lose the variation. So yeah. that sounds like almost sounds like a negative thing. You're losing variation, but actually oh, what no. you mean is their blood sugar is rock solid they start stable. To get flat blood you don't have the That's highs right. and the lows and you're not requiring as much insulin. So um, okay. in in milligrams per deciliter, some people will will, will describe with a typical sort of uh, person who lives with type one diabetes might have an average blood glucose of say a hundred and uh, who's who's struggling, might have a blood glucose of say hundred and eighty milligrams per deciliter or 10 millimolar, mm -hmm. that would be somebody who's really having a hard time. Yeah. And their standard deviation might be somewhere around 100 milligrams per deciliter um, or, or, or five millimoles of, of variance. Right. So these are people who are bouncing from high to low all the time. And if you then compare that to somebody who's in nutritional ketosis, who has learned to do this and do this really well, they can get their blood glucoses down to somewhere around 110 milligrams per deciliter, uh, which is simply amazing. So six millimolar. And they can get uh, standard deviations down to around 30 milligrams per deciliter or two millimolar. That's a fantastic change. And what, what impact does that have on the patient? Well, so the, 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 the most obvious thing right away is that the blood sugars aren't bouncing between high and low. And there is a tremendous cognitive burden that's associated with living with diabetes and thinking about your blood sugars all the time. So when you look down at your blood sugars and you realize that they're near normal all the time, you start to forget about diabetes and you start to think about other things in your life. So right away, people notice and they describe that they get what I would call cognitive real estate. Mm -hmm. they, they get back some of their ability to think about things other than diabetes. Um, they will also, also often lose weight. And the reason is all that excess insulin is associated with weight gain. And in the original so, uh, DCCT trial, the people who were on that intensive therapy gained quite a bit of weight. Mm -hmm. Too much insulin, ultimately fat growth, uh, dipogenesis. And for people who go on nutritional ketosis, be it uh, people who have diabetes or don't have diabetes, they virtually all lose weight. Uh, so it's a very potent way to lose weight. And many people with type 1 diabetes who stay in nutritional ketosis uh, 
st start losing weight, and they will lose weight all the way to the weight that they were in back when they were, say, 16 or 18 wow. years old. Yeah. That, and that's powerful, and especially when you, when you talk about sort of the emotional real estate or the, the ability to think about other things. Because people who, who don't suffer from a chronic disease like type 1 diabetes take that for granted. Yeah. And, and it's hard for us to even imagine having to constantly think about your, your, your health and your condition and not have the ability to think about other things in life. So, I mean, that's so powerful right there. But let's talk about the practicality of it mm -hmm. because people, there are plenty of people who said, ah, I've tried ketosis, it's it's too hard. And then there are pl plenty of people who do it and thrive on it and it's easy to do. Yeah. So when you're talking about teenagers and 20-year-olds, what's the practicality of this type of intervention to help people? Well, the, the way I think of this is it's a tool. And so my goal as a clinician is to teach people the power of the tool mm -hmm. and to allow them to use it when they decide to use it. It's not up to me to sort of judge that, oh, you need to go on low carb or right. you need to try nutritional ketosis or, you know, you have to use this and you, you know, you, you shouldn't be eating carbohydrates. I don't get to choose. I'm not the person who lives with type 1 diabetes. So I think it's up to us to support people. If someone's curious about it, I, as a clinician, I try to teach them how to do it. And I ask them to be very aware of what they're experiencing with the hope that they will be more holistic about what the tool is, and then they can make their own decisions. Uh, but I try to I'll allow them to consider not just the medical benefits, i.e. with low carb, you might be able to get your blood sugars down to a near normal level. 16 year olds are not sitting around worrying about whether or not they're gonna get diabetes complications when they're 70 years old. I think that, that the much bigger issue is how do you feel? How do you wanna feel? You know, are you upset about the way it's going with diabetes? Are you curious to try to find a different way? How much of a burden is it currently? And I've interacted with teenagers who you would think don't actually care about their diabetes at all. You know, someone who's sitting in the exam room who has a pump, but the pump, uh, they never change the catheter and they struggle with very high blood sugars and they're, and they're losing weight because they're peeing out a bunch of glucose in their urine and they look sullen and exhausted and angry. And if you ask them, you know, how do you, how do you feel about living with diabetes? Do you think about it? And do you think about it often? And quite often they will uh, just start crying. Oh, wow. And so what's happening is someone who isn't working actively to treat their diabetes by you know, checking all the time and administering insulin is still thinking about diabetes and they feel tremendous guilt and shame uh, and they wish they could do something better but they can't motivate themselves to actually get up and do it. I'm, uh, us adults, we're all teenagers at some point and you can remember feeling overwhelmed and, right. and also be feeling unable to take the initiative to do things that probably would be uh, beneficial to you in your life, right? There's always some homework assignment that goes undone or, mm -hmm. you know, some job that could have been done uh, a little more carefully as a teenager. They're growing up, right? Right. Uh, but I, I try to encourage them to understand this as a potential way to feel better. And my hope is to build habits. And I, I don't know if you've read this book, The Power of Habit, sure. but I, I just love it. Yeah. And I love the idea that we could find ways to learn to build these systems into our life that could ultimately be beneficial and allow us to focus on the things that we really care about. Yeah, I mean, that is powerful, especially if they can experiment with it and, and finally experience the feeling of feeling better and not right. being burdened by the disease. And it sort of comes up against, though, the desire to be normal, right. quote unquote normal, sure. whether it's a parent just wanting their kid to have a normal life and the emotions right. of the parent, right. or the kid just wanting to be part of the crew and go out with their friends and not mm -hmm. have to worry about it. There's definitely a conflict there between doing what you can do to feel better and, and improve your health versus, quote unquote, fitting in. And I'm sure that's something you must address on it all the time with your patients. So that kind of conflict, I, I think, is recognizable to any parent of a teenager. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, my kids are now no longer teenagers. They're in their 20s. But um, I can certainly remember it. And kids really want to be able to do their thing. Not all of the conflict is actually what it, per, what it seems on its face. Mm 
So sometimes teenagers will generate conflict as a means of trying to show that they're upset about something. Mm. And they're looking for a loving, structured response from a parent. So a teenager will say something, you know, I, I can still remember uh, my kids uh, would, one of them really knew how to, how, to, how, to, how, to, how to get me, you know, upset. And she would do it as a way to, of trying to show me that she was upset. Yeah. And, my, and my wife would look at me and she'd, you know, say, hey, I need to talk to you. And she'd say, and she'd pull me into another room and she'd say, you know, she's trying to get you upset. And um, I got news for you working <laughs> <laughs> frequently does right and so you know it's our job to be there to support them mm -hmm. and in some cases what they're looking for is a loving structured response hey it's okay I understand why you f would feel that way let's give it some time and we can talk about this in a bit yeah right right and teenagers are in some ways also like toddlers they're looking for structure and they're looking to know that their parents care about parenting enough to be able to bring their A game, right? right? And so what's the A game? It's imagine yourself as a parent and looking, and looking at your roles and your responses and saying, am I doing this in the way that I really would hope that I could? Or am I get, getting caught up in the moment? Yeah. I, I think about this a lot in medicine. And what I try, I sort of imagine myself as a coach and I'm trying to build people so that uh, build up the persona, the health persona that somebody has, either uh, the person who lives with a chronic illness or a parent. And I'm trying to show them that if they think very deliberately around their lives and, and, and they're mindful, they can be aware of the way they respond and they can make more thoughtful, meaningful decisions. We, we don't have enough emphasis on mindfulness right. in, in, when, when we talk about chronic illness, and yet it's so important. The decisions that you make from, from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, add up and they alter how you perceive your experience of living with chronic illness. Yeah, it goes a lot deeper than just take your medicine, that's no, for sure. sure. Yeah, and, and I, can, I can just imagine how these discussions need to take place. and. Not just in one visit. You're not no, gonna, yeah. Someone's not going to get it in just one visit, right? This right. is over months and years right. and years of working with people to try and help them understand these concepts, isn't it? Yeah, the five-minute mindfulness handout. Right. <laughs> okay, they've got aromatherapy, it's a meditation, right. it's some exercise, see you, bye. Go, go do it. Um, it we have to build relationships and yeah. ultimately build trust. And uh, I, again, what I love about medicine is the opportunity to, to work as a coach and to help people live their lives and to carry out uh, uh, the health uh, growth around health conditions um, so that they can ult ultimately achieve their goals. Yeah. They're not my goals. So it's really important that you, I'm, I, I really imagine myself as a facilitator, as right. a Sherpa. I'm there to help them to carry this burden and to think creatively about ways to do it safely. Yeah, that's a great way to say it, to think creatively about ways to do it safely. And it's clear you're doing a great job with it with a potential amazing impact. But what about the structure of healthcare now? Is it supportive of this way? Or are most people, if they talk to their doctor about going on a low carb carbohydrate diet to help treat their type 1 diabetes, are they going to hit a stone wall when they talk about it? What's the culture now? You know, it's, it varies from place to place and from provider to provider. Yeah. If you look at the American Diabetes Association guidelines, um, which are, they call the standards of care, and you look around low carb and diabetes, what you actually see is that the American Diabetes Association is permissive. It has um, endorsed low carb as a possibility. For it, type one. For, for type one or for type two, yeah. they don't differentiate. Okay. They, they do not endorse it for children or for pregnant women or for people who are taking this new class of drugs, these SGLT inhibitors. But for the rest of the population, um, they, they're permissive. They okay. leave open the possibility of low carb. So there's a misconception in the community that the American Diabetes Association or these other large organizations, that they are prescribing particular kinds of foods or macronutrient distributions and that they will not allow low carb. That is generally incorrect, um, as, at least for adults. Uh, 
So, so we're, we're growing as a discipline. We're becoming a more open-minded. We recognize that most people who live with diabetes, type 1 or type 2, they have a very hard time achieving the glycemic targets to minimize complications. Right. And the diabetes associations are becoming more permissive about allowing low carb. Unfortunately, healthcare providers and nutritionists still haven't adapted to this. So every year when the standards of medical care comes out, the American Diabetes Association document, I obsessively read it and I go through and I, I, I do keyword searches and I try to see how the language has changed from year to year in order to determine whether it's growing and evolving. And what I've seen over the past five years since I've been doing this is it really has changed. So the American Diabetes Association has become much more aware of the existence of low carb and they don't explicitly prevent it from, from as, as an eating pattern. Now, you will get a different response if you go to your healthcare provider because many of, many of them were educated in a different era and they believe that, that uh, you have to consume a particular amount of protein and fat and carbohydrate and that's it. Mm -hmm. Many of them are prescribing these so-called macronutrient distribution ratios from the Institute of Medicine guidelines from the so-called AMDR that came out in 2002. And that's a very odd document. Um, and unfortunately, it, so the AMDRs made this almost arbitrary decision that too many carbs would cause hypertriglyceridemia and potentially could alter cardiovascular risk. And too much fat, they believed, would cause obesity. Oh. And so they chose a middle ground, mm. uh, believing that that was the way to minimize uh, complications and, and to um, ultimately advance the health and wellness of people with diabetes. Unfortunately, actually they used that for the general population, but it was applied by diabetes uh, um, organizations as also applying to diabetes. And the rationale was people with diabetes are at great risk for cardiovascular complications. So right. we should give them the diet that is generally accepted to be best for the general population. But what we now know is those calculations were really quite arbitrary. And if you read the Institute of Medicine document, what you see is an immense amount of subtlety around this. So it's very hard. So let's go back to the person who goes to their local diabetes doctor or endocrinologist or primary care doctor, or they see it. A, a diabetes uh, educator, that person will have been educated in a different era, may have had a, a summary of what was generally accessible at the time as the best available evidence. Yeah. And the field, um, and, and, and most people are receiving healthcare based on a scientific consensus that was generated 20 or 30 years ago. And if you try to talk to them about what you might have learned from the internet, about low carb or something else, people will get very defensive. So that's a challenge. Um, and I, some doctors have been eager to learn new things. Other people are very, very defensive. Yeah. And in the worst case scenarios, I've heard of patients actually getting fired by their doctors. So getting a letter that says, um, I want to let you know that, um, I, I, that you will no longer be able to come see me. I will provide health care for you for the next 30 days. Here's a list of available providers in your area. See you, bye. Yeah. All because they don't want to talk about diet. They don't want to talk about lowering carbohydrates. Well, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I think yeah. that these are, these are well-meaning providers who believe that there may be a grave danger to right. pursuing low carb. They're afraid. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's a somewhat of a, a debate um, amongst us who are interested in the low carb community. I want to bring this up. Yeah. So some people have believed that the, that the doctors are really arrogantly prescribing uh, their particular approach and that they're excluding or that they're prejudiced against low carb and that uh, they, they simply aren't open-minded. There's an, I, I'm a little more charitable about this. I think they're simply doing what they think to be best. And, you know, I spend my nights and weekends reading about the low carb literature, reading the, the latest study, reading the latest guidelines, and I try to keep up. But it's a subject area that I'm intensely interested in. It's become my hobby. Not every healthcare provider will be similarly motivated to learn in this particular subject area. Right. So I think there's a lot of really talented, well-meaning docs who simply haven't been exposed 
to the transformative power of low carb approaches for be it for type one or any other condition. Yeah. And frankly, there also isn't a lot of scientific consensus. So I've been telling you what I do clinically, but I cannot point to the well-structured, well-funded, randomized controlled clinical trial that's carried out by a large organization, be it the US NIH or in Europe or, or some other organization. And I, uh, the reality is there hasn't been enough hardcore research on, yeah. on, on low-carbohydrate low nutrition for lots of metabolic conditions. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's a great point to emphasize that we can see the benefits in the short term. Yep. We can see the benefits with lab results and how people feel, but we don't have that long-term survival and decreased complication data. Although it makes sense, you know, sometimes you have to operate outside of, right. of the evidence when it simply doesn't exist. And it makes sense that if you're hitting all your markers, it would lower your risks, but we can't prove that. And on the other hand, this can be a dangerous thing to do. You have to be very vigilant of checking your blood sugars and adjusting your insulin quickly because right. things can change very That's quickly. Right. And we don't want people just trying it right. on their own with no guidance. Right. So what kind of advice can we give to somebody who's looking for some help and looking for some guidance? Well, there's a lot that's been written about low carb and, and diabetes and specifically low carb and type 1 diabetes. So again, I mentioned Dr. Bernstein's book, but he also has a, a YouTube channel with lots of videos and, and practical advice. And then there's also a um, Facebook group called Type 1 Grit, T-Y-P-E-O-N-E-G-R-I-T. -E -E and these are people who are followers of Dr. Richard Bernstein, and they support each other in this community. There's 3,000 members. It's really a wonderful organization. So that's been very, very successful. And then there's 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 other books as well. So Adam Brown has has written a terrific book on diabetes, and uh, Keith Ren, Dr. Keith Runyon, who's a nephrologist who has type one diabetes, has yeah. written a book on nutritional ketosis and type one. So there's an emerging literature. But so what I'm saying is, it's important to educate yourself and to look around. And there are a bunch of resources. Um, it will be very important if you carry out an if you have type one diabetes, you want to carry out an experiment around low carb to be careful about the amount of insulin. So there are some people who are on fixed doses of insulin. They, they take pretty much the same amount of insulin from meal to meal and from day to day. And if you're gonna, if you wake up in the morning and you normally consume 75 grams of carbohydrates and instead you decide to eat bacon and eggs or to fast and you take the same dose of insulin, well, you're gonna go low. Yeah. So it's important to adjust insulin doses downward dramatically in order to figure out uh, you know, the, the right dose. It, and, and it's gonna require a lot of experimentation. So mm -hmm. I, there are some people only check their blood sugars uh, with finger sticks. Other people have access to these new continuous glucose monitors. I think those are really great for low carb and type one. They provide so much data that allows you to think much more holistically around what's happening to, to, to your blood sugars and how any particular meal has contributed to, yeah. to blood sugar outcomes. So I started this episode by saying I was very hesitant to, to recommend low carb for anybody with type 1 diabetes. But yeah. after learning from you and others, now I think they're almost a perfect population for it. And part of that is the use of the continuous glucose monitors yep. and the insulin pumps because they more than anybody can finally control their blood sugars and their insulin far more than anybody else. Right. But it takes vigilance. It takes, it takes care and it takes a lot of work, but it's certainly possible and powerful as you've demonstrated. Um, so tell me, what are, your, what are your hopes for the future? What do you see coming that you think might be revolutionary or really help patients in this field? Well, I'd like to see more access to, to continuous glucose monitors. Yeah. That's the first thing because they're expensive. And I think as the price drops, as people become, uh, as they start to get on the continuous glucose monitors, they become more and more aware of hidden glycemic excursions, these surges up and down. And, right. and those folks will then become more motivated to try to learn new creative solutions to how to control their sugars. So CGM is in some ways like the gateway drug <laughs> to low carb because it, it, it provides the impetus to try to find a new way. And I don't wanna give you the wrong impression that I think that low carb is the primary tool to improve sugars. There's a bunch of other things you can do as well. And exercise is incredibly important, especially uh, endurance exercise. Yeah. So I would recommend anybody who's thinking, who's thinking about trying to improve their diabetes control with type 1 diabetes to consider uh, 
endurance exercise like running. Running is a fabulous thing to do. Yeah, we talk a lot about high intensity interval training and resistance training yeah. and sort of cardio endurance training has sort of got almost gotten a bad name lately that it's it's not as effective. But in this specific scenario, it seems like it is the most effective. Yeah, so there's a, a there's a unique pathway in a slow twitch muscle whereby um, exercise can promote glucose uptake into skeletal muscle. And so you can create this sponge that's, that's drawing glucose off of your blood into the muscle by doing a bunch of endurance exercise. And there are people with type 1 diabetes who use this to, to really great effect, who run marathons, who yeah. run all the time. And those people quite often will have very, very low insulin requirements. And in comparison, high interval training or high intensity training, interval like training, people who have these big muscles, that, that, that musculature does involve some, some carbohydrate, of course, but it often also involves insulin. Yeah, and that type of training can transiently increase your glucose as well, which yes, may right. put you on a, exactly. a chasing cycle as well. Right. So yeah, it's a little more complicated. And then sleep, of course, is also really important. And many uh, young adults are sleep deprived. They, quote, catch up on the weekend. Yeah. And so I really advise people to, to think very carefully about how much they're sleeping and try to develop careful sleep habits so that they're going to bed at the same time every night, yeah. even on the weekends. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time and for all your knowledge and your, and your work in this field. And I really like how you how you balance the message between approaching people as people, not just a, a science experiment of glucose and insulin, but what it means to them as a, as a person. Uh, I think that's so important, and, and we all need to learn that, that lesson. Yeah, I know we're really just here to support people. And so yeah. uh, helping them to think ab about their bodies and, and, and live their lives the way they intended to, I think is really, that, that's our role in health. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I look thank forward you. to hearing more from you. Thanks.